So let me invite, and I'm very pleased, happy, and honored to invite Jacques White up to tell you about his work, his family, and his family. I, I took a job down in Louisiana as a research technician uh, at the very end of the road where the jackup arches and the shrimp docks are. Uh, then I moved to Maryland and, and got a doctorate in oceanography. And I worked for about 15 years total as a researcher. Uh, but I, I started to have a, a crisis of conscience. I started to suffer environmental grief, I guess. And uh, I decided I wanted to do something a little different, so I, uh, I took a job back home here at a place called People for Puget Sound, and I uh, ran a, a shoreline conservation program there. And then I went to work for the Nature Conservancy, and um, I could really relate to Dr. Kevorkian's talk because in the same year, my dog and my mother passed away, and I, I changed jobs. And I came to work for Long of the Kings uh, to run the organization as a new challenge. And I'm not quite sure which of those was, was the more uh, affecting of me, but, but clearly uh, I, I treated my dog as more of my animal companion than my pet. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is we have a program that we're working on with some Canadians. About 150 people are involved in this. We're leading the U.S. side of the team, uh, trying to figure out why salmon and steelhead are dying before they reach the Pacific Ocean. They leave our rivers. As far as we can tell, they're in good shape. They don't make it to the Pacific Ocean, and this has changed over the last 30 years, and we're trying to figure out why. And, and I'll just go straight to the conclusion so you can uh, track what I'm talking about uh, and see if you think that we're, we're making the case for this. There's three different species we're looking at. Uh, steelhead, which are listed under the Endangered Species Act here in Puget Sound. Chinook, which are uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act here in Puget Sound, and as you all know, it's the preferred food for orcas and uh, the coho, which are not listed, but the population is not thriving here in Puget Sound. Um, the bottom line is, is that we think for coho, uh, there's some combination of increased predation and uh, poor food supply that's causing the <coughs> increased mortality. For Chinook, we think it's the same two factors, plus perhaps contaminants from our urban estuaries. And for steelhead, uh, we think it's something to do with, uh, certainly predation is the most dominant uh, problem with their marine survival, but also might be impacted by contaminants and diseases that they're picking up in their native rivers. So those are the, those are the factors I'm going to talk about that. At first I'm going to talk about those salmon in, in the aggregate here in the Pacific Northwest and what it means to us. I, I found Gay Bradshaw's talk very interesting in thinking about um, me as part of the community and not like, the community as the place where I'm from. And so I, I think that all of us are part of the salmon community here in the Sailor Sea. And, and as we think about that, and you think about some of the elements that I'm talking about here in the relationships, you can see how, ask yourself through, through this talk how you fit in. Um, but I'm going to ask some questions right now. How many, I, I'm sure you all uh, care about orcas, and that's why you're here. Um, how many of you uh, care about salmon? How many of you have eaten salmon? <laughs> How many of you have caught salmon? Okay, so, so you're part of the salmon community, you're part of the salmon-based ecosystem here in the Pacific Northwest, and, and as I, again, as I talk about this now, I, I generally don't use a whole lot of text in my slides, but this particular presentation, because I'm going to be providing you with information that is not yet published, and is also not as familiar to me, I used to be a scientist, but now I only play one on Saturday. <laughs> Uh, uh, it might be helpful for you in the back to move forward. Now, I'm not going to say you have to, but if you want to, it'll be easier to read, and I've got, I've got some more text than you. So, um, oh, it helps if you turn this on. Okay, so uh, what is controlling salmon and steelhead productivity in the marine waters of the Sailor Sea is the title of my talk. Um, uh, a little bit about how we do our work. We're, we're 20 uh, 31-year-old organization. We have three areas we work in. We advance science, which is what the Save the Sea Survival Project is. We retool management. We're working with NOAA on a, on a uh, steelhead recovery plan for Puget Sound so we can identify what actions and get funding for that for steelhead recovery. Um, we also rebuild populations. So we're actually 
this is a fish from our, our Glenwood Springs, and, and you had that out absolutely right. The, the stream that we grow these shit up on is this wide, and the fish that come back are this long. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable. There are no rivers around there. We have very low spray rates, so this is probably about the most sustainable fish culture that you can find in the Pacific Northwest. We grew them in natural ponds as opposed to tanks. Doesn't mean that hatcheries are, are all good, but this one is particularly helpful for fisheries and not very harmful in terms of other populations. We also rear um, steelhead and are rebuilding wild steelhead populations uh, in Hood Canal. Uh, we grow beautiful big fish like this and put them back into their native rivers uh, without changing the genetics of the population or, or the life um, like fisheries. Why, why do I do this? I mean, I care about the environment, but I also care about future generations. The two kids in the middle are my next door neighbors. Uh, I want to make sure that they can enjoy orcas. I want to make sure that they have salmon that they can go watch going up their native streams. I want to make sure they can eat salmon from here and they can tell stories to their kids about salmon and their relationships to the environment. So I think ultimately this is why we do this. Um, some context about salmon here. There are 11 different species of salmonids in the Pacific Northwest. Everything from the everything from the, the tiny uh, mountain Pacific mountain whitefish to the mighty Chinook. Um, these are steelhead up here, and these are coho. Uh, so these are the other species that I'll be talking about today. Um, something about the salmon life history. I'm sure almost everybody in this room knows that salmon spawn in the fresh water and then they live in the fresh water for a while and then they go to sea and they come back. Uh, that's, and, and most salmon species die uh, when they reproduce in the fresh water, but steelhead and some of the other trout species uh, actually can spawn and go back to sea and come back multiple times. Um, steelhead, have, of all the salmon, steelhead have the most complicated life history. They can stay in fresh water and become a rainbow trout and never go to sea. They can go out into sea for a few, a few weeks or a few months and come back. Uh, into the freshwater environment like a coastal cutthroat, or they can go out to sea, stay at sea for up to five years and return as a great big fish, great big silver fish. So they have a very complicated life history. They can, they can spawn with little tiny rainbow trout. They'll actually sneak into a spawning bed when there's a big steelhead, a couple of big steelhead males, a big steelhead female, um, eat a couple of eggs, fertilize them, and you know, you, you win twice. Um, Chinook are the second most complicated. Chinook have 14 different life histories. Some of them stay in the river and are there for a year, like more like a coho. Some of them go right to sea as little tiny fry. Uh, and so there are a number of life histories that have adapted to different conditions in the marine and the freshwater environment. And these different life histories allow them to succeed. One of the things that we have done over time to our Chinook populations is narrow that diversity. And I'll talk a little bit about that, and that will come up later as having impact. Um, so what does salmon need? I think we all know that salmon need healthy rivers and there are a number, they need different kinds of habitats and river places to spawn, places to rear, uh, places to rest when they're migrating up or out, out of the river. Um, but, but generally they need cold water, they need clean water. Uh, generally we understand that because we can see the salmon when they're in the river. But they also need healthy estuaries, particularly the Chum and Chinook. Uh, they need healthy nearshore environments with seagrass beds, uh, kelp beds, um, uh, invertebrates for them to eat, and they also need to help the ocean. Um, Chinook can spend up to three quarters of their life in the open ocean. So a, a really large June hog Chinook will have reared in the Pacific Ocean for up to five, maybe seven years before it returns back to its native river. So that's a long time. And while it all looks the same to us from up here, there are very different habitats and very different conditions. And the Chinook that rear in the ocean, I, and any other salmon species, identify particular areas of the North Pacific, maybe at different times of the year, and they migrate to those areas, and they're focused in those areas <clears throat> because that's where their food is. And that's how uh, southern resident killer whales can find them, because they're not spread out you know, homogeneously throughout the ocean. They're very targeted on ocean fronts and places where you have upwelling and where there's lots of food. So it, 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 it isn't a mystery, but we need to understand those and what we're doing to those environments uh, as we change the environment ourselves. So why are salmon important? Well, uh, recently uh, passed away, Billy Frank was a tribal leader, uh, both here in the Pacific Northwest for fisheries rights and internationally for aboriginal rights for people. 
he identified that um, you know this is an ecosystem and a community of which we are a part. And in order for us to have uh, healthy salmon, in order for us all to be healthy, we have to have an environment that can uh, maintain healthy salmon populations. I think this is something that we're all familiar about and why we're here. Chinook salmon are the primary food resource uh, for um, our southern resident killer whales. <clears throat> and Long Live the Kings has a dual mission. We're focused on recovering wild salmon and steelhead and supporting sustainable fishing. And I think from day one, uh, Howard uh, uh, alluded to this, we consider this to be sustainable fishing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, salmon also support our terrestrial ecosystems, large animals like bears, um, eagles, uh, but also insects are, are uh, salmon is a really important food source for insects in our, in our watersheds. And I think maybe many of you are also aware that uh, much of the large trees or the vegetation that are in our uh, Pacific coastal forests uh, have a, a tremendous amount of their nitrogen that's derived from the ocean that is brought back by salmon. A 50 pound Chinook carcass that comes up and lands in the watershed and is then fed upon and distributed by animals, insects, and birds around the watershed becomes a great nutrient source for these. And you can see in a place like the Elwha River, way up in the watershed, enormous trees that are growing right by the river that have been fed by those giant chinook that return and other species of salmon that get up in the basin. Um, uh, salmon have been a cultural uh, and important food item for na uh, native peoples here for generations. Uh, in fact, uh, salmon was such an important uh, resource to them when, when they negotiated with the U.S. for um, <coughs> status as, as, as sovereign nations, they didn't care about the land, but they cared about having access to hunt and gather and fish in their usual and custom areas. And that is a key foundation of the relationship between our government and the native governments. There are um, something like 26 treaty tribes that have fishing rights in Washington state. Uh, 20 of those are in Western Washington. Um, Recreational fishing has a long history. This is a, a 16th century Dutch woodcut. Um, in the Pacific Northwest here, we have had people come from far away to fish and to use this resource. Uh, this is, in case you don't know, this is uh, Lauren Jackson, the basketball, former basketball player for the Seattle Storm out fishing in Puget Sound. Um, there is a huge economy that is built around recreational fishing. And so as we try to protect salmon uh, as a resource for southern resident killer whales, we're also trying to pr protect it as a resource for people in the environment in the, in the region and also some of the economic, uh, um, <clears throat> it's a big economic driver. Um, commercial fishing also has a long history, at least in, in Western culture. This is a, by the same artist that this is showing commercial fishing in Europe. C currently, the only commercial fishing that goes on at any scale in Puget Sound is executed by the tribes on sockeye returning to the Fraser River in Canada and some commercial fishermen re, uh, fishing largely on hatchery reared chum salmon in Hood Canal. Pretty much all, uh, and there's some, I think, gill netting on uh, chum salmon that are returning to central Puget Sound. Pretty much all other commercial fisheries in the marine waters of Puget Sound have been um, eliminated because of loss of the resource, and most tribal fishing occurs in the, their native rivers. Uh, but on the coast, uh, even though this is not a big part of the economy that for the state as a whole, for places like Iwako, um, or, or uh, Forks, uh, or, or the Push, uh, or Nia Bay, uh, commercial fishing is a critical part of those local communities, and, and it employs um, a large percentage of the people and provides a large percentage of the income in those areas. So it's something that, as we think about providing resources for salmon, um, we also need to think about maintaining uh, abundant salmon resources to support these fisheries. But now, most of the fish that we eat at Puget Sound uh, comes from wild Alaska, not wild Puget Sound. Uh, there just aren't, isn't the abundance anymore to support that kind of um, resource for us or for the resident killer whales. Another interesting thing that has changed over time is the shift of overall salmon production to supply um, uh, food needs of human populations from wild caught salmon to uh, farm raised salmon. So you can see right around 2000, uh, farm raised salmon eclipsed wild caught salmon as, as the dominant uh, food resource. 
Now this can have some problems because the way we run our, our salmon farms and open net pens in the marine environment can impact our wild salmon populations. Uh, and they certainly don't provide a resource for killer whales because they go straight from the pen to the market and they don't, they're not in the environment to share with um, other animals. So um, salmon, you know, in, in where I live, I, I live in West Seattle and I work in downtown Seattle, it, it's, it's almost more of a, a cultural echo uh, we still identify with salmon, we still identify as salmon people, but it doesn't drive the core of our, our economic activity. But people still care about salmon deeply, and one of the things that we try to do at Home of the Kings is to maintain it as a core element of our culture. So how are salmon doing? Well again, Billy Frank uh, was really concerned about the plight of salmon, and he felt strongly that without salmon, the fishing rights weren't worth anything. And so ma maintaining those uh, those populations are critically important to the health of that element of the native culture here. Um, so salmon used to be really plentiful, and when Europeans first arrived here and, and Americans first moved to the West Coast, they exploited it heavily. This is 30 million fish caught in Puget Sound, Washington. And you can see those are quite large. Um, so what's happened? I, I was noting when I was looking at the graph that Howard put up that um, 1984 is about the time when the population of uh, orcas started to really go up. And I think the period from about 1984 to the early 1990s was the most rapid growth rate that we had uh, of orcas. And you can see that the harvest at that time was really quite high, and, and salmon were really quite abundant. Um, so this is the total. This is the total abundance. I'm sorry. This is the harvest. This is the total abundance. So, so when these uh, Chinook salmon populations in the Salish Sea combined for Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia were very high, that's the time that coincided with the highest growth rates of our southern resident killer whales. When you look at where we are now, you know we're at least half of the numbers of salmon returning to our rivers to spawn. So there's been a steady decline. When you look at harvest uh, for that same period of time, you can see that the fisheries managers really dialed back on harvest over the period of time that those salmon populations were declining. To the point where, when Chinook were listed in 1999, uh, harvest rates were one third of what they were in 1984. So this is when, when people claim that the only problem that we have with uh, salmon recovery is harvest. I have a, I don't have, I have a hard time with that. I think that our fisheries managers are doing a generally good job of dialing back harvest, focusing that harvest on hatchery fish uh, to the best of their ability, and trying to allow escapement for wild fish. It's not perfect, but it's it's uh, it's it's pretty good. So that if you look at the, if you take the harvest out of that and look at just the escapement, even though we've dialed harvest back by three times, um, we're not getting, or, you know, by, by a factor of 70%, we're not getting the kinds of returns, a response in returns that we would hope. So, so that's just one factor to consider. Um, another factor that I think is critically important, it, and, and I guess the other thing I want to say about this is something else must be going on besides harvest. And something changed between the mid-1980s and now that is not allowing these populations to rebound. So another thing that happened is that our fish used to be really big. Pretty much across the board, our salmon were double the size that they are now. Pick any species, uh, and you can say they're double. This is particularly true for Chinook, which had the longest potential ocean residency and the largest potential body size. It's very rare that you see a Chinook uh, 40 pounds or more any longer. And those used to be, if not common, certainly not rare. Um, and, and so one of the things that has happened during the same period of time is that the, um, the numbers of early returning Chinook used to be about half the population in the mid-1970s. And now today, uh, they're only about 10%. So we have really flipped uh, the diversity in our population from a mix of early returning and late returning fish and almost all late returning fish. And this might uh, represent a couple of things. Um, the, late, the, the early returning fish um, uh, tend to be in higher in the watersheds in places like the upper Elwha, in places like the upper uh, 
uh, upper Skagit or the Suwaddle River, uh, places like the upper Puyallup River. And these access, these areas are hard to access because of dams, fish, uh, ocean harvest that is occurring, uh, recurring on, on each year's population, maybe reducing the chances of those larger older fish getting back to spawn compared to a, a younger fish that's smaller. Um, and then lastly, hatchery production is really, really focused on these late returning fish. And, um, and those may be uh, starting to dominate. So one of, the, one of the things I'm going to talk about later is the potential response to poor marine survival is affecting this. So when I, so, so we saw that um, you reduce harvest and you're not getting a response in terms of productivity. What could be going on? And one of the things we found in an international salmon conference that was held in 2010 is that uh, everybody noted that marine survival of some of these key species had dropped off uh, and had been low for about 30 years. So what this graph shows, I'll, I'll, I'll orient you because there's really quite a bit going on here. Um, this is marine survival as a percent. And what that means is the numbers of adults that return to a river mouth uh, divided by the number of smolts that left that river the year that they were spawned. So it's the number of adults that return two, three, four, five years later, divided by the number of smolts that went out the year that they were, and we, can, and we know which year they came back because we can look at their ear bones and count what year they're from. And along the uh, x-axis, it starts in 1974 and ends in 2010. So what you have is for San Marine survival, the blue line is Puget Sound, uh, the red line is the Strait of Georgia, and the green lines are combined all coastal rivers, including the Columbia. So what you can see is that for Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia, somewhere around the mid to late 1980s to the early 1990s, marine survival fell off and never recovered. What you can see for the ocean rivers is that it went up and down probably fluctuating with um, ocean conditions and the amount of food in the ocean based on you know, the, the, the immediate climate. Uh, but there was no real trend except for steelhead, which went down and then recovered to some degree. So what this tells us is that there's something different about the Salish Sea compared to the ocean, and there's something bad going on with the, early, with the marine survival of uh, these three species in the Salish Sea. So this seemed to be a, this seemed to be a problem, and, and we said um, Long of the Kings has had some expertise in putting together large technical efforts to look at how hatcheries are run and to try to reform those to be more uh, uh, compatible with wild fish recovery. So we took that facilitation expertise and we tried to put together a team in the U.S. to address this issue. It turns out that our friends at the Pacific Salmon Foundation in Canada have already done the same thing. They recognize this as a problem. They put together a proposal, they couldn't get it funded. So we started to think, we, we, we threw our resources together and said, let's think about this as a research topic uh, because it has really important management um, uh, outcomes. So during this time, while that marine survival of salmon, salmon steelhead populations was declining, other things were going on. Um, we had uh, ling cod populations, true cod populations, rockfish populations, herring populations, certain populations, zooplankton and kelp populations that were all declining uh, generally, not, not everywhere, but in general throughout the Salish Sea. But we had some other things that were changing. The numbers of seals, the number of harbor corpuses, the number of pink salmon, uh, the numbers of jellyfish, the temperature of the water, uh, and of course the land use and the development and urbanization throughout the basin were all increasing. Uh, but what's interesting is that we were seeing reductions in marine survival in places that, that did not have a great change in urbanization, places like Hood Canal, places like the northern Strait of Georgia. So, so it was hard to blame this all on urbanization. There was something going on in the basin that was affecting this. So what is it that causes a juvenile salmon uh, to be successful or not? Well, we think of things, we call them bottoms-up controls, and we talk about top-down controls. So the, at the very basis of this is the climate and the weather that's generated by the climate. So we have, see, we have annual cycles in climate that change the weather. We have multi-year cycles like uh, uh, El Nino.
Nino that cause changes in the weather, and we have multi-decade changes in the weather caused by something called the Pacific Decadal Decade Oscillation and other oscillations. So those control um, the growth of phytoplankton, which is the base of the food web, and that feeds uh, small invertebrates that uh, are food for juvenile salmon and juvenile fish, like herring. Um, but there's also things that can basically kill the fish outright, that we call those top-down controls. Disease is one of those, um, toxic chemicals is another one, and of course predators. So if we were going, we figured if we were going to evaluate the marine survival of all these species, we had to take all of these things into consideration. And it makes for quite a complicated picture. Um, so let's look at some of the factors that we saw before we started the study. So this is, I love this graph, this is at a place called Race Rocks, which is on the southeast corner of Vancouver Island. And this shows the temperature record from 1920 to 2012 every month in the surface water. And what you see here is a pattern of shifting between a colder and warmer surface water temperature. And you can see that it looks like, you know, in the uh, 30s to 40s it was a little bit hot, from the 40s to the um, 60s it was generally cooler, and then there's a little burst of hot weather, and then from what we call, what we now think of in, in our management memory as the good old days, from about 1965 until about 1985, it was generally cold. Uh, and, then, and then something happened where somebody, it looks like somebody flipped the switch, and from about 1985 until now, it's been a hot, hotter than the previous 40 or 50 years. So uh, this is it, right? Uh, and that controls what kind of food um, we're going to see for uh, the juvenile salmon. Turns out Chinook really like crab larvae, at least now. Um, but there's other things going on. So this shows contaminants in Chinook. Um, uh, some of all what we call persistent organic cup toxins. And you can see that for the Snohomish, the Green River, and the Puyallup, the big urbanized Seattle, Everett, Tacoma estuaries, um, we see elevated contaminants. So that could also be a factor, at least for those populations. Um, diseases, we hear about potential problems of swimming by salmon farms and salmon picking up sea lice. Um, are there other diseases that might be introduced from, from uh, farmed salmon in the marine environment? Or are there diseases that are coming in that are changing their, their virulence because of changes in temperature in the environment? We don't know. What about, I mentioned, hatchery practices? Is there something we're doing with our hatcheries that is making uh, juvenile fish in the marine environment survive less well? Um, near shore habitat changes. I mean, we certainly think something like one third of the Puget Sound shoreline is armored in some form or another. Um, is that having an impact on the food available to them? And then uh, predators. Um, th these populations have changed significantly over time. Um, so, Looking at all these issues, um, we decided to try to put together a joint U.S.-Canada research program we're calling the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. And um, it's, as I mentioned, it's a Salish Sea-wide anomaly. So this is occurring in the northern end of the Strait of, uh, Straits of Georgia, near Johnstown Strait. It's occurring in Olympia and down in Belfair and Hood Canal, all, and all the way in between. Um, so this is kind of gives you the scope of the project. We have over 150 researchers, there's over 60 partners. Um, we are raising, we said we would raise $20 million in new resources to match existing funds and, and resources on the ground to do this work. We said we're going to take a five-year cut of this to see what we can figure out in that period of time. Um, it's in two countries, and there's one question, and that's what's happening to these fish. So this is our NASCAR slide, uh, and you can see we have really broad representation, everything from local governments to uh, universities to uh, state, federal, tribal agencies, U.S. and Canada, um, uh, really very, very good cooperation. And, you know, it's funny, I was looking at, I was going through our, I have to check all the checks that we sign off as the director of our organization, and I, I saw one time that we had written a check for $163,000 to NOAA, and I was, I, I take that with me when I talk to my congressman and say, see, we're helping you guys get your job done. <laughs> um, so what do we do? We're, the, we're like the hustlers. So, so we put the, the technical team together. We convene those groups to decide what the research plan is going to be. Um, we handle the money. Uh, that come, much of the money comes through us. And then we, 
um, give it to the researchers, and we check to make sure they're doing what they said they're doing, we kick them in the butt, um, we will be synthesizing this information, and then we go around and talk about it like I am today to try to make sure that people understand what's going on and what kinds of things we have to do. I should say, our partner is the Pacific Salmon Foundation. They're actually a much larger and better organization in Canada than we are, but we're really, we're really happy to be working with them. Um, so here's the thing about the money, and the only thing I want you to see here is if I just told you that we had written a check to the feds for $162,000, um, the, the one source of funding that we thought we were going to get more money from was the feds. So I'll just highlight that. We thought we were going to raise about $2.3 million. We've raised about $900,000, most of that from EPA. Uh, so we have this much left to raise. Of course, that's going to be much easier now, right? <laughs> But uh, we, the, our Canadian partners have raised more money than us, but we like to remind them that that's Canadian dollars. <laughs> so we're really more equitable than we were. Um, and we, we were, we're working hard. So we're right in the middle of our, um, our third year of four years of research. Or not, we're right, right at the beginning, really, of the field season of our, our third year of research. And so we, we will be in the water in 17 and 18, and then, then we'll be writing between 18 and 19, and try to write this up. Um, so this is just a numbers of studies completed. We're, we're pretty, we're only promising 15 manuscripts. I'm sure more will come out, but that's all we would take credit for trying to drive out the door. Scientists are notoriously slow to publish, um, some of them. <laughs> and some of them, we already have five papers out, though. That's only after two, two and a half years of research. Um, so again, I talked about bottom up the framework for the research. We're looking at what is controlling the food resources and the food abundance for them, and is that important? And then looking at some top down factors, and then to put it all together, we've hired some modelers to take this information and synthesize this and try to tell us um, how much of what factor is important. What part of the community? Now this is where, if you're taping this, everything that comes after here <coughs> is um, is most of what comes after this is not published. So. I'd ask you not to disseminate this, um, and this I was asked by the project manager to put this ominous looking slide in here. Um,